Cadillac, for many, has been the car that dreams are made of. It stood for luxury and speed. Owning a Cadillac told the world you'd arrived. It became the car for wealthy socialites and the movers and shakers. Cadillac turned heads and melted hearts. It became an icon of America. Cadillac is riding a wave of renewed popularity. Its sales mushroomed as its edgy new vehicles caught on with buyers. Hip-hop artists flocked to its oversized SUV, the Escalade. Suddenly, General Motors' aging luxury brand had street cred. It had been said that the typical Cadillac owner was between 65 and dead. But as rap stars were joined by suburbanites taking advantage of a tax break that allowed them to write off the purchase price of this monster hauler, things started to look younger. This re-energized brand perked up and went on the attack. Its coming out party at the 2003 Detroit Auto Show created a buzz when the 1,000 horsepower Cadillac 16 concept car rolled out onto the stage. Its presence screamed, we're back. The showrooms were filled with sporty BMW fighting sedans, and these cars started to make believers out of those who'd never considered owning a Cadillac. To keep the pressure up, Cadillac unleashed the XLR, built alongside the Corvette. It looked like Cadillac might once again be called the king of the road. To understand Cadillac's long journey back, we need to go back to the beginning. The auto industry was bursting with ideas in the early years of the 20th century. It seemed that everyone had a new car in development. It was similar to the dot-com boom of later years. Most of these cars were expensive and most weren't very good. A big problem was that there were no standards for making all the parts that went into a car. As a result, things just didn't fit from one car to the next. Building cars was a gamble. This made any form of quality control impossible. It also kept mass production from developing. Henry Leland had an idea. He'd worked for the gunmaker, Colt and seen how it made all the pieces fit together, time after time. He started to use these techniques in his work for the fledgling automaker. Oldsmobile heard of his reputation for precision. In 1901, Ransom Olds asked Leland to build a better engine for his curved dash old. These were the leading seller at the time. Leland's attention to precision gave his engines 27% more horsepower than those built by other suppliers. While Olds didn't use the Leland engine, it demonstrated his work. Word spread about his quality in the tight-knit auto community. Leland met with Henry Ford's investors. They were losing patience with Ford and looking for someone to take over. They'd backed Ford in the Detroit Automobile Company. They wanted to build cars for the rich. Like most people, they wanted to go where they thought the money was. Ford had other ideas. He thought a low-priced car for the masses was the way to go. The money people thought he'd lost his mind and went shopping for a replacement. This was the conventional wisdom. Cars were luxury items that were expensive to build and costly to own. Ford was out at the Detroit Auto Company and Leland was in. 
While Leland was happy to concentrate on catering to the carriage trade, he didn't think Ford was completely wrong about mass production. He just wanted to build a lot of cars for the rich, not the masses. When Leland came on board, he took the name and crest from the French founder of Detroit, Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac, and set to work. His Cadillac automobile company had a single cylinder vehicle with good clearance that helped it to navigate the era's rutted road. Leland's biggest challenge was to find a way to apply his ideas about precision manufacturing to a whole car, not just an engine. But his first breakthrough was a four-cylinder engine. He put one in his personal car, the 1905 Osceola. Leland was tall, and the Osceola had a custom body designed for him. It was the first car with a fully enclosed passenger compartment. While the new engine was a technological success, he was still perfecting his precision manufacturing ideas. He felt that if he could find a way to get all the parts to match from car to car, his vehicles would stand out in the marketplace. A standard for measurement was the key. The Johansson gauge blocks gave him the answer. He bought this box of gauges from a Swedish company and used them to make all of his tooling conform to a standard set of measurements. The accuracy made possible by the blocks made interchangeable parts a reality. High quality mass production was the next step. England's Royal Automobile Club tested his precision built cars and awarded him the Dewar's Cup. The cars became known as the standard of the world. As Cadillac sales grew, the founder of General Motors, Billy Durant, sought to put the luxury brand in his shopping cart. He offered Cadillac's investors over $5 million for the company and took it away. Leland stayed on and started to find that being part of a larger organization gave him the capital to innovate. One of the biggest stumbling blocks to making automobiles more popular was finding a way to eliminate the crank. People got hurt, some even died when the car backfired and the crank twisted out of their hands. In the best case, hand cranking was hard work. Leland approached Charles Kettering and asked him for help. Kettering had perfected a spring mechanism for opening the drawer on cash registers. He thought a modified version would work as a starter on a car. It did. In 1912, Kettering's self-starter became standard equipment on all Cadillacs. Within a few years, almost all American cars had the Kettering electric starter. World War I changed Leland's priorities. He knew that aviation was going to play a large part in this conflict and thought the company should build airplane engines. Durant was a pacifist and didn't want anything to do with the plan. Leland quit Cadillac and started a new company to build Liberty Aero engines. The engines were built too late to see combat, but Leland was free to start Cadillac's rival, Lincoln. When the war ended, Cadillac was ready to build cars for the returning soldiers. After a brief post-war recession, the economy started to boom. Many people became flush with new money made in the stock market, real estate, or the movies. Designing custom bodies for rich people's cars, like this Pierce Arrow, with a body by Harley Earl, was a growth industry. Cadillac noticed that Earl was building quite a business out in California. GM's chairman, Alfred P. Sloan, thought it would be a good idea to have someone with Earl's flair working directly for General Motors. He sent Cadillac's president, Lawrence Fisher, out to California to meet Earl. Fisher convinced him to design a roadster for Cadillac that became known as the LaSalle. The 1927 LaSalle 
was inspired by the European luxury car, the Hispano Suiza. Its classic proportions were a hit, and Sloan asked Earl to become the first stylist to work for a major manufacturer. Leaving sunny California was hard, but Earl went to Detroit and changed the automobile industry forever. Earl's Hollywood style would be challenged by the sudden collapse of the economy. Earl's old hometown trade paper, Daily Variety, described it best. Wall Street lays an egg. In October of 1929, the economy unraveled. Millions of people were thrown out of work. But oddly enough, there was still a market for luxury cars. The rich had money. Auburn, Cord, Duesenberg and others produced the most powerful and stunning cars ever created. It was a golden era for custom-built cars. These were the kings of the classic car age. Cadillac created a V12 and then a V16 engine to power its luxurious land yachts. The V16 was the world's largest automobile engine. It was beautifully styled and had advanced features like an oil filter and air cleaner. This powerful beauty weighed in at 1,500 pounds, about 1,000 pounds more than a modern engine. It was an immediate hit and found its way into the top of the line Cadillacs. This 1931 Satan Red Sport Phaeton from the Cadillac Museum is one of the finest examples of custom modded Cadillac. The V16 engine gave the car a top speed of over 95 miles per hour and showed the world that Cadillac could compete in the upper end of the luxury trade. Customers could buy a chassis from Cadillac and then have a stylist build a custom body for them. Or they could choose a limited production body from GM's Fleetwood division. It was a time when the only limitation was one's imagination. This 1937 V16 powered Cadillac was built for a Swiss playboy. He wanted a streamlined car to drive to his favorite haunts along the Riviera. It caused a sensation. Cadillac also refined its V8 engines, and Earl's stylists were finding ways to bring custom touches to mass-produced vehicles. This was the death knell for the custom coach builders. Even the very rich decided to save money and buy mass-produced luxury that was often better built. As the Depression ended, Cadillacs began to show the influence of the streamline and art deco movements. Running boards disappeared, and cars were dripping in luxury. The seats had double-wrapped springs stuffed with down, roll-top cigarette ashtrays, a hidden gasoline filler under the left rear tail light, and the first hint of a tail fin. The 1941 Cadillac Special is a classic, but there wasn't much time to enjoy this car. turned the world upside down. All auto production stopped, and Cadillac joined the war effort. Cadillac turned to building tanks. Its rugged V8 engines and automatic transmissions impressed the army. They were fast and reliable, and soldiers were familiar with them. Many had been mechanics before the war and knew how to repair them. This kept the mechanized army on the move. When the war ended in August of 1945, Cadillac scrambled to return to making cars. The first cars off the line after the war were identical to the 1942 Cadillacs. 
they used the same tooling as they had before. It would take several years for the company to develop an all new car. Earl's stylists tried out several prototypes. The winner was inspired by the Lockheed P-38 fighter. Earl loved the jet age, and he loved the plane's tail fin. The fin wars had just begun. Cadillac kept one step ahead of the competition when it introduced a new high compression V8, air conditioning, and fully automatic transmission. General Motors vaults were bursting with money, and no other luxury car maker could keep up with Cadillac. Millionaire sportsman Briggs Cunningham hoped that no one could keep up with his Cadillacs. He took two of the new V8 engine powered cars to race at Le Mans in 1950. The French dubbed one of the massive cars Le Monster or the Monster. This car was fitted with an aerodynamic body designed by an engineer at Grumman. The other was a stock coupe. The two cars came in 10th and 11th overall. Not a bad finish, but Cunningham decided he'd return with a sports car of his own design the next year. Cadillac wasn't a winner on the track, but it was beating the competition in the showroom. Packard didn't have the money to keep up and started to decline. Lincoln was hobbled by the financial mess that its parent company, Ford. Cadillac took advantage of its position and turned out cars with more power and options than ever seen before. It offered a 210 horsepower V8 with a four barrel carburetor and dual exhaust, all to move a massive and impressive body. The 1953 Cadillacs sold more than twice as many cars as Lincoln. Riding on the publicity of Cunningham's racing effort, Cadillac showed off its Le Mans concept car in 1954. It boasted a more powerful V8 wrapped in a ground-hugging body. Lincoln's designers took notice and planned a response. The Lincoln Mark II was their attempt to show the world that they could still compete. These low volume cars cost $10,000 in 1956. A valiant effort, but not enough to break Cadillac's leadership grip. Cadillac was selling over 140,000 cars a year by 1955. Lincoln came in second at 35,000. It was the car for enjoying the good life. Cadillac's designers knew how to snare the American male. The car's bumpers sported well-endowed rocket-shaped features, affectionately dubbed Dagmars, after a buxom TV actress. But it was the rear of the car that would ignite the next automotive craze. Chrysler co-opted Cadillac's fins with its forward look. By 1957, Bigger fins were better. Cadillac countered Chrysler with its 1957 Eldorado Brome. It spent $27,000 each for these big finned image cars. They sold them for a little over $13,000. The cars were crammed full of the latest technology and styling features. Two position memory seats, electric window vents, an automatic trunk opener, and the first transistor radio in a car. Women had built-in lipstick holders and a vanity kit, complete with a customized atomizer of Arpege perfume. Cadillac sold only 457 of these hand-built cars. They called it the car for those who could afford tomorrow's car today. Today, they're worth between $30,000 and $40,000. Cadillac's show cars 
were even more over the top. The real wow was about to come. In 1959, a bigger engine, better shock absorbers, and improved power steering were touted as sales features. But the only thing most people noticed was the fin. Cadillac had turned this car over to a young designer, Chuck Jordan, who went on to become GM's vice president of design. No one knew that these cars would become icons. They'd been featured on stamps, as art objects, on clothing, and in countless music videos, films, and commercials. The flamethrower taillights and rocket ship design are emblems for the era. While critics may deride them, be prepared to spend over $125,000 if you must have one. The fans of the Finns cooled slightly in 1960. There was nowhere else to go, so the Finns started to get smaller. The 60s was an era of change, and Cadillac, like all the other American cars, would feel the pressure from increasing competition. In the boom years after World War II, Cadillac and the rest of the American automobile industry have been able to sell almost anything they could build. The conventional wisdom was that if you could push it off the assembly line, it would sell. There was really no incentive to improve quality or safety, efficiency, or add advanced engineering features. There was no real competition from abroad. Germany, England, Italy, and Japan had all been devastated by the war. The few imports that trickled into the States were mostly seen as fun toys for the well-heeled or quirky cars for fringe buyers. These cars didn't pose a threat to Cadillac. But as companies like Mercedes recovered from the war, they refined their cars. They built high-quality vehicles with features like disc brakes and enhanced safety. People began to question the assumed leadership of the American automobile. Sales continued to grow throughout the decade. By the 1970s, Cadillac was selling over 200,000 cars a year. It had come a long way since that first car rolled out in 1903, but the challenges of the outside world would finally force Cadillac to change. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting States, or OPEC, turned off the oil spigot and gas lines sprouted up all over America. The government imposed new fuel efficiency, environmental, and safety regulations that forced the automakers to rethink what they made. Suddenly, the pressure was on to downsize. The newer, smaller cars turned off their older, traditional buyers and never caught on with younger people who turned to BMW, Mercedes, and eventually the Japanese. A series of ill-fated cars like the Cimarron and the Alante further eroded the Cadillac image. Oddly enough, it was a truck-like vehicle that started to show that the company still had promise. The Escalade was a luxury version of the SUVs originally built for General Motors' other divisions. While some derided the gigantic SUVs, the success of the Escalade was one of the first indications that Cadillac had found a way to reach younger buyers. Finally, they had something to brag about. Other new vehicles followed, and it looked like Cadillac was regaining its confidence. There's still a long way to go before Cadillac can once again claim to be the standard of the world, but with any luck, it's on its way.
perked up and went on the attack. Its coming out party at the 2003 Detroit Auto Show created a buzz when the 1,000 horsepower Cadillac 16 concept car rolled out onto the stage. Its presence screamed, we're back. The showrooms were filled with sporty BMW fighting sedans, and these cars started to make believers out of those who'd never considered owning a Cadillac. To keep the pressure up, Cadillac unleashed the XLR, built alongside the Corvette. It looked like Cadillac might once again be called the king of the road. To understand Cadillac's long journey back, we need to go back to the beginning. They to use these techniques in his work for the fledgling automaker. Oldsmobile heard of his reputation for precision. In 1901, Ransom Olds asked Leland to build a better engine for his curved dash old. These were the leading seller at the time. Leland's attention to precision gave his engines 27% more horsepower than those built by other suppliers. While Olds didn't use the Leland engine, it demonstrated his work. Word spread about his quality in the tight-knit auto community. Leland met with Henry Ford's investors. They were the auto industry was bursting with ideas in the early years of the 20th century. It seemed that everyone had a new car in development. It was similar to the dot-com boom of later years. Most of these cars were expensive and most weren't very good. A big problem was that there were no standards for making all the parts that went into a car. As a result, things just didn't fit from one car to the next. Building cars was a gamble. This made any form of quality control impossible. It also kept mass production from developing. Henry Leland had an idea. He'd worked for the gunmaker, Colt, and seen how it made all the pieces fit together, time after time. He started... Cadillac is riding a wave of renewed popularity. Its sales mushroomed as its edgy new vehicles caught on with buyers. Hip-hop artists flocked to its oversized SUV, the Escalade. Suddenly, General Motors' aging luxury brand had street cred. It had been said that the typical Cadillac owner was between 65 and dead. But as rap stars were joined by suburbanites taking advantage of a tax break that allowed them to write off the purchase price of this monster hauler, things started to look younger. This re-energized brand. Cadillac, for many, has been the car that dreams are made of. It stood for luxury and speed. Owning a Cadillac told the world you'd arrived. It became the car for wealthy socialites and the movers and shakers. Cadillac turned heads and melted hearts. It became an icon of America.